Hi, Mark. Hi, Will. How are you doing? I'm doing very, very well. Uh, and how are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Well, thanks for coming on to Free Will on Blogging Heads TV. Uh, I am Will Wilkinson uh, with Cato Institute. Uh, I'm talking from my uh, office in Iowa City, Iowa, and you are Mark Schroeder uh, at uh, the University of Southern California. Um, mm -hmm. Tell uh, our audience a little bit about yourself, uh, what your field is, and uh, and uh, where you're teaching, and how yeah. you got there. I'm a philosopher. I'm an associate professor of philosophy at the University of Southern California. I spent two years teaching at the University of Maryland, where uh, Will was actually my TA in my first large lecture course. Oh, that's uh, right. I got my PhD from Princeton in 2004. Uh, and uh, um, I work on uh, issues in metaethics, which is a fancy name for just lots of complicated um, issues philosophical issues, thinking about the nature of morality and the nature of moral thought and moral language and uh, what moral facts are like, if there are any. And, uh, and we're going to see some of those issues come up today in our conversation. We're mostly going to talk about reasons for action, which I've spent a lot of time thinking about. And they're the topic of um, my first book, Slaves of the Passions. From Oxford yeah, here it is. I'm holding it up to the screen. Uh, Slaves of the Passions. Uh, it's got a nice uh, picture of... Uh, uh, a, uh, you know, uh, yeah. So uh, I don't know what what era is that? A Victorian era couple embracing um, passionately on the cover. Um, uh, that's a famous quotation from uh, Hume uh, that most people I will uh, have heard. Uh, Reason is and ought only be the slave of the passions. Um, and so you're defending a broadly Humean view that uh, that, uh, that 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 reason in some sense. Uh, is and ought to be uh, slaves of the passions, um, but let's uh, well, really, let's say really, it's sort of a it's sort of a play on words. So Hume says mm -hmm. that reason, in the singular, is mm -hmm. and ought to be the slave of the passions. Where the idea is that reason is sort of maybe a faculty that we have of of rational thought. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really talking about a faculty of rational thought. I'm talking about reasons in the plural, which are like the pros and cons that you think about when you're trying to decide what to do. So if you've got a really big decision to make, you might be thinking, yeah, well, you know, should I do it or shouldn't I do it? And you go back and forth, and sometimes you think about some things in favor that make you want to do it, and sometimes you think about some things that sort of count against it. And those are those are reasons for action, the things that count in favor of doing it or count against of doing it. They're the things that you list in the pros and the cons column if you're trying to follow uh, Benjamin Franklin's advice about how to... Uh, uh, how to draw up a decision procedure and try and decide uh, carefully what you're going to do. Um, mm -hmm. They're the pros, they're the cons. And so so the view that I'm interested in the book uh, is the view that the pros and cons for a person are uh, closely related to um, the passions, broadly speaking, but to what people want or what they care about or what they're interested in. What the pros and cons are for you depends on what you care about, and what the pros and cons are for me depends on what I care about. That's the that's the idea. So it's like well, that seems it's, like, it's like that seems so so profoundly count. That seems profoundly uh, you know intuitive. Uh, and so the example that you start the book with is you know there's these two guys. Uh, one of them likes to dance, and one of them doesn't. And so you find out that there's a party that there's going to be dancing at. Um, that's a I mean so. The fact that there's dancing is a reason for the guy who likes to dance to go to the party, um, that, not a reason for the guy who doesn't like to dance. I mean, everybody. Uh, so uh, that seems just common sense. Uh, so what? Why would there be a hitch? Why is there anything you say about it, right? So yeah, yeah actually, I do. You say about it at all? That's yeah, so, I, well, uh, so obvious that uh, that our yeah. So I, I talk about that example. I talk about that example a lot to motivate the view and try and explain the different moves that I make uh, throughout the book. I talk about this guy, Ronnie, who likes to dance. Guy Bradley, who can't stand dancing. I keep going back to them, talking about that example. Um, everybody wants to know if they're a couple, but it doesn't matter for the book. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and intuitively, if there's going to be dancing at the party, that is a reason for Ronnie to go, but it's, it's not a reason for Bradley to go. It's a reason for him to stay away. And I think it is intuitive. That's why I talk about it, because I, I think the basic idea of the human theory is very intuitive. 
But there's been a really big uh, backlash against this theory over the last 30 years among philosophers. Mm -hmm. And and the real reason is that um, it sort of raises trouble uh, for another very natural idea, which is that um, moral reasons, like the reason that you have to help somebody who needs help, or the reason that you have not to kill an innocent person, are reasons that you have no matter what you're like. So it doesn't really matter if you sort of don't sort of want to only be want to be the kind of person who doesn't kill or like mm -hmm. not killing uh, you've got a reason not to kill even if you happen to like killing uh, even if you don't happen to like not killing um, so more reasons don't seem like they depend on what people like or dislike or what they care about or want to do in this kind of way and so that makes people worry that makes people think look this this whole Humean idea, this idea that reasons depend on what you care about or what you like, that theory is going to run into trouble when it comes to when it comes to explaining why morality uh, has this kind of grip on us, that it tells us what to do no matter what we like. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. um, so some people think that's a good enough argument that that theory is false. There are some mm -hmm. reasons that we have no matter what we're like, the moral ones. So not all reasons are like Ronnie's, only some are. And other people think, other people go on to give other arguments, other problems for the Hemian theory, other kinds of reasons to think that it's a bad theory. And so the book is really about all these different kinds of arguments that are arguments against the Hemian theory and trying to understand what makes them look like good arguments, even though, as I argue, they're not. So let's, let's drill down a little bit more on, on what it would mean for somebody's desires to be uh, uh, to ground a reason for them to do something. So we, we, if, if you say that uh, my uh, the fact that I like dancing is a reason for me to go someplace where there's dancing, um, are you saying that when I'm thinking about what to do, what I should be thinking about is what my desires are? That the, that the nature of deliberation about what to do is has to do with you know your examining your desires to see whether or not uh, you have a reason. Um, no, I, 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 I definitely no. don't want to say that. So, so one thing I distinguish is I distinguish between whether your reason um, is a reason because you desire some things, mm -hmm. or whether your reason is a fact about your desires. So this sounds sort of subtle and nitpicky, um, but I think it's important. So if you, if you, for example, uh, if you um, want some coffee, mm -hmm. and there's coffee in the lounge, I, do. <laughs> um, uh, I think the fact that there's coffee in the lounge is a reason for you to go there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but um, the fact that you want some coffee, it might also be a reason for you to go there, but I don't think that's important. I think that the fact that you want some coffee explains why this other thing's a reason for you to go there, the fact that there's coffee in the lounge. Um, and the reason I think that's important is that it's natural to think that the, uh, the reasons, the pros and cons, the things that count in favor of an action and count against it, are the kinds of things that you should be thinking about when you're trying mm -hmm. to decide what to do. When you're trying to decide what to do, you should be thinking about what the pros and cons are. Um, that's how you should decide. You should sort of weigh the pros and weigh the cons, and if the pros beat the cons, then you should do it. And if they don't beat the cons, then you should not do it. So I think that's a very natural idea, and that's something that I want to make room for. But some people mm -hmm. uh, haven't, and, but some people have interpreted the Humean theory to hold that uh, your reasons are really facts about your own desires. Mm -hmm. And so the way those people interpret the Humean theory, if thinking, if reasoning and deciding what to do really does involve thinking about the pros and thinking about the cons, then it's always going to involve thinking about your own psychology. So when you're trying to decide what to do, you're always going to end up thinking about yourself. So you might, you might imagine somebody, uh, um, and the example I talk about is a guy named Ryan, and Ryan's in a position to help somebody. Um, Katie. Katie needs help. And Ryan's in a position to help her. And 
Uh, intuitively, the fact that she needs help is a reason for him to help her. That sort of counts in favor of helping her. That's something you put on the pro side if you stop to think about it, which hopefully you wouldn't. You just do it. Um, but um, uh, if the real reason to help her isn't that she needs help, but it's that she needs help and Ryan wants to help her if she needs help, or that she needs help and Ryan wants to be a goody two-shoes or something like that. Yeah. Um, that's really objectionable if, if Ryan, you know, is kind of thinking about whether to help her and he thinks, yeah, she needs help, but that doesn't decide it for him. He's got to keep thinking until he realizes that that's what she wants. That's a sort of very depressing picture about what um, mm -hmm. more reasoning would be like, and I don't want to endorse that picture. I think that's a wrong picture. I think that somebody who's morally good uh, can be um, acting for their reasons. They can be... Um, uh, just thinking about other people or other things in the world and not always thinking about themselves. But this yeah, so, is part so you, this is you yeah. distinguish between things that are, 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 are background conditions that help explain why something is a reason for some someone mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to what the actual explanatory reason is for them, the thing that explains why they uh, were motivated to do it, right? So, so you, you, your view isn't that uh, when I see I, 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 Katie's in need and my reason isn't that, oh, I see Katie's in need and so I, I, I'm like, well, do I have any reason to help her? And so I have to think about do I have it, do I like helping people, who, you know, I have a desire to help people get what they need. So yeah, I guess I do I do have a I do have a, a reason to help. Uh, you're saying that's not what's going on. Yeah, uh, I think it's that's simply the fact that you not. have some. You do have a desire. That's like I have a desire to help people get what they need. Uh, that desire explains why I have a reason. Um, mm -hmm. But why I actually what I take my reason to be needn't have any reference to that desire. That's right. So when you're thinking about what, whether to help Katie, if you really care about helping people who are in need, then if you, when you find out that Katie needs help, that's going to be enough to decide it for you. You're not going to need to keep thinking, you know, ah, but is that something I like or not? If you really care about it, then you'll act. And similarly, I think that if you really care about it, it's a reason for you to act regardless, and it's not that the the fact that you care about it is the real reason. The fact that you care about it explains why the fact that she needs help is the reason. Hmm. So I think this Similarly, is actually, I think this is a good go illustrative example of how the, the, the dialectic or the kind of argument goes in a number of different chapters of the book. So this argument, this objection we've just been talking about uh, is what I call the objectionably self-regarding objection. And the objection hmm. is that According to the Humean, surely, people are going to have to spend their time thinking about their own desires when they're trying to decide what to do. And a lot of people have offered that objection. And I think it's not a good objection. I think that there are certain assumptions you can make about how the Humean theory goes where it would be a good objection. But I think those are the wrong assumptions to make. So if you did assume that the Humean theory held that reasons were all facts about desires, then I think this would be a good objection to the Humean theory. But I think the Humean theory doesn't have to think that. The Humean think, might think like me, that reasons are just facts about the world, not always facts about your own desires. So you can think about your reasons, you can weigh the pros, you can weigh the cons, without always being stuck thinking about your own psychology. Now, now t tell me a little bit more about how uh, a person's reasons relate to their beliefs, because I think there's sometimes some confusion in this regard uh, as well. Because um, mm -hmm. I think what you're trying to say is that your reasons are established by just a real fact out there in the world about the relationship between some action and something that I want. Um, and I need not actually have a belief about that relationship. So it can be the case that I have a reason to do something uh, without knowing it, right? 
Like I can right. that, that, that I can have Good. a reason to do something without having any idea that I do have a reason. It just happens that if I did it, it would help bring about the satisfaction of something that I desire. That's right. So so go back to Ronnie and Bradley again. So there's a party tonight. There'll be dancing there. Ronnie likes dancing. Bradley can't stand dancing. Maybe neither Ronnie nor Bradley knows they'll be dancing at the party. But I still think there's a difference. Going to the party is a better choice for Ronnie than it is for Bradley insofar as there's dancing there. Okay. And but there's also an important thing that happens when you believe the thing that's the reason. So so Freddie might be another guy who's just like Ronnie. He likes to dance. Um, he's invited to the party too. Uh, mm-hmm. But Freddie might know that there's dancing there. Now, there's something special going on with Freddie that's not going on with Ronnie. He's, he's sort of, he's aware of the reason that Ronnie isn't aware of. And something changes when you're aware of your reasons. When you're aware of your reasons, then all of a sudden, we can expect you to act for them. If um, we might mm-hmm. expect Freddie to go to the party since he knows, and we wouldn't expect Ronnie to go, um, and we might think uh, Freddie was being irrational if he didn't go to the party since he loves dancing so much and he knows there'll be dancing there. Whereas we wouldn't think Ronnie was irrational for not going. Um, yeah. So, so there, I think there's two important different things that happen here, and I call them the objective and subjective senses of the word reason. I think that you know, there's an objective reason for you when there's something that's true, that it's a real feature of the world that is and would go in the prose column. And I think there's a subjective reason when you believe something that, if true, would go in the prose column. And so uh, ultimately, I think the human theory wants to explain both. Mm-hmm. But, but the one I'm most concerned with explaining is the objective relation. Um, I think that once you explain the objective relation, the subjective relation is just a matter of you know believing stuff that is the kind of thing to be an objective reason. Yeah. So, so, so for, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. For, for example, I mean, like to think about how these things come apart. I, I'm, I'm, I'm holding a, a, a can that says Diet Dr Pepper, right? Uh, so, if it's the case that I would like some Diet Dr Pepper, um, that's a reason for me to drink what's in this can, as long as what's in this can is Diet Dr Pepper. Okay. Uh, now, I have I, because it says Diet Dr Pepper. I have a reason to believe that it's got Diet Dr. Pepper in it, right? So, so I take myself to have a reason to drink it because I want Diet Dr. Pepper. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it actually contains uh, gasoline, I have a yeah. reason not to drink it, even though I believe that I have a reason to drink it. That, I have a, the the fact that it's not. gasoline is an excellent reason not to drink it. Mm-hmm. But you could be forgiven for drinking it if you thought it was Diet Dr. Pepper. So, so what matters for, um, for what you can be forgiven for doing is what you believe, right? But, mm-hmm. but what matters for what the best thing for you to do is, is what's true. If you're going to give somebody else advice, so if I, knew, if I knew that your can really had gasoline in it and not Diet Dr. Pepper, and you asked me, you know, um, should I drink it or not, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't think... Well, gosh, you know, he thinks it's Diet Dr. Pepper, so I better recommend that he drinks it. No, I think uh, uh, it's gasoline. I better tell him not to drink it. It doesn't matter what you believe when I'm giving you advice. It matters what's true. So the facts are important for what's true for and giving advice, whereas what you believe is important for what it makes sense from your own point of view to do. And those are sort of two sides of an important coin. So let, let, let's talk a little bit more about uh, the force of... I, I, I was always naturally attracted to a view very much like the one uh, that you lay out. And, and in my struggle to defend that kind of view, which I was never able to do uh, nearly as well as you do in your book, uh, uh, incidentally, which is, uh, which is remarkably... Uh, uh, lucid and uh, and rigorous. Uh, so I, I, I meant to congratulate you on just the the, the high level of, of of clarity and uh, a sort of illuminating rigor that's in the book. 
Uh, so, and, 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 but one of the things that I always struggled with was how to respond to some of these objections. So, uh, so if, if you take morality uh, to offer reasons to people, uh, that, that, that we have uh, moral reasons, um, but moral reasons have a particular character, um, and this can't take care of it. This can't. This can't. This can't account for what we take to be the character of moral reasons. And so, and so some of it has to do with this sense of it's it's self-regarding in uh, in, in in the wrong kind of way. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, and I think a related worry um, has to do with the idea that and, and and maybe you can say this in a clearer way than I than, than I can mm-hmm. um, is that. One, one, there's just a conviction that that, that moral uh, reasons are, in one sense, categorical, right? They 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 mm-hmm. they are binding, uh, n- regardless of anything that happens to be true about you or your psychological states. Uh, if you're a person, then moral rules bind, um, and 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 this doesn't give an account to that. This it, it, and it's something. Similar to that is the idea that that that, that moral reasons are uh, are are then and, and maybe you can help help me draw out the logical connections between these different uh, different ideas is that uh, moral uh, reasons are agent neutral in a particular way that mm-hmm. that uh, that they don't mention uh, a relationship between um, a person and an action. I'd say it, if Katie needs help that's a reason to help um, mm-hmm. and uh, and then it, and that's categorical in the sense that that's a reason no matter what I think um, so can you, can, you, can you draw out uh, these ideas about the the categoricalness of moral yeah. uh, rules and their agent neutrality and how you deal with that yeah so so some reasons like Ronnie's reason to go to the party is just a reason for him to go to the party it's, it's not a reason for Bradley to go to the party uh, it's not a reason for people who aren't invited to go to the party. Um, but uh, other reasons seem like they're just... It's not that they're reasons for anybody. They just seem like they're reasons. So the fact that Katie needs help, that's a reason to help her. It might be a reason for me to help her and a reason for you to help her um, as well. Uh, but you might think it's a reason for us to help her because it's a reason to help her. If something's a reason to help her, then it's a reason for anybody to help her. And some reasons are like that. That's what I call agent-neutral reasons. The reasons that are reasons to do something full stop. Not just reasons for me or for you to do it, but just reasons to do it. Um, now, uh, I think that some of the best examples of intuitive cases of reasons like this are moral reasons. Reasons not to kill. Reasons not to steal. Reasons not to lie. Um, reasons not to break promises. Um, I think that intuitively, uh, many of these reasons uh, seem like they apply to anybody, no matter what they're like or no matter what their situation. Certainly, even if they don't apply in some situations, it's not just a matter of what the person cares about that makes a difference. Um, So they seem to apply to us no matter what we care about. And this is this creates this is the tension that I think is sort of at the heart of why there's even some any philosophy to do about the human theory, um, and it's what I call the the too few reasons objection to the human theory. So the idea is there's this human theorist who comes along and he says uh, um, all and only the reasons are like this. There are things that are related to your desires in a certain way. Uh, and then he goes on to spell out the rest of his theory. And uh, the objector says, wait a minute, according to your theory, what you've got a reason to do depends on your desires. But intuitively, at least in some cases, it doesn't depend on your desires. You'd have that reason even if you didn't have those desires. Okay. And mm-hmm. the way that Humean theorists have usually reacted is they've said, yeah, Moral reasons aren't really like that. Maybe there aren't any moral reasons. Or maybe uh, moral reasons would go away if you stopped caring about certain things. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, I'd like to do more to make sense of this common sense idea about morality. I'd like to try and capture it to explain what people are thinking and to explain mm -hmm. why it could be true. And so one of the biggest things that I do in the book is to try and explain within the Humean theory how even though reasons depend on desires in some sense, they don't depend on desires in a sense that makes moral reasons problematic. And so the, the work all goes into trying to make the distinction between what those two senses are. So I, I, can, I can say a little bit about that. So, so yeah, that, tell me, tell me a little bit about. Um, so, you've got a particular gloss on, uh, w w w which I, I find uh, interesting, and that I think might have interesting implications about what seemingly uh, agent neutral uh, sort of moral statements are. You seem to you say that they have a kind of uh, that they're kind of elliptical. That they're actually talking about. Uh, Humean style reasons that apply uniformly to a set of people, um, mm -hmm. and and that, that that they have a sort of implicit restricted scope to them, um, and so uh, can can you explain a little bit about that? Sure. So you're talking. So the the idea is that if I say there's a reason to do it, but mm -hmm. I don't say who it's a reason for, yeah. then um, then. I think when we say things like that, we really mean that there's a reason for everybody to do it, or at least for all of us to do it. Now, usually when we say that, when we say there's a reason to do it, we're happy to infer that there's a reason for John to do it, a reason for Sue to do it, a reason for me to do it, a reason for you to do it. Cause why? Because there's a reason to do it. And since that seems like a good inference, I think that supports the theory that... Um, that when we say there's a reason to do it, we just mean there's a reason for everybody to do it. Um, now, um, it's true that sometimes we talk that way when we don't really think there's a reason for everybody to do it. So suppose that you and Ronnie and I are getting together, trying to decide what to do tonight, and Bradley's already left, he's doing something else. And so we're trying to think about whether to go to the party. And I say, well, uh, They'll be dancing at the party tonight, so that's a reason to go there. Um, I don't mean it's a reason for Bradley to go there. He's out of the picture. Mm -hmm. We've stopped thinking about him. So maybe sometimes when we talk this way, we just mean it's a reason for all of us to go there, and not everybody counts. And, uh, so the, but I th so but the, I the trick there is, 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 is limiting that set, who's, who, who's in and who's out, who's the us. Mm -hmm. And that still seems like that can be seem pretty dis, uh, like an unsatisfying formulation for people who are really committed to the to the universality of certain kinds of moral reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I might say I, I actually think this is a this, this is a, a feature rather than a bug of your theory. But I, but but I I because I, I, I like the idea that because uh, one thing I I'm interested in explaining is why there is such. Uh, visible and remarkable um, diversity in the moral reasons people take themselves to have in different places. Um, mm -hmm. But within different places, there seems to be a lot of uniformity and that people talk about uh, their reasons as if it's uh, has these, th as if it doesn't really matter what you think about it. It's just um, the case that one shouldn't, you know, break. Uh, one of the edicts of Sharia law, right? The fact that it is the religious law is a reason, right? Mm -hmm. Regardless of what you think. Um, but uh, it, it, we don't think that. So, so it, for me, this helps explain why how how a certain kind of moral discourse can seem to have an agent neutral uh, feel to it. Um, yet I can come in from the outside and say, like, I I, I don't take myself to have a reason to do this simply because it's uh, the religious law. Um, mm -hmm. d d is, that, is that any the, the kind of thing that you're thinking with your in your view, or is that just completely yeah. off the... Well, I'm thinking something a little bit different. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking that in the cases where, um, where we're just talking about what we have reason to do, mm -hmm. and Bradley's out of the picture, 
I think that's one kind of important case. Um, yeah. Uh, but then there's other cases where we really mean our, what we're saying to apply to Bradley too, even though he's not here. Yeah. Um, so the case of talking about uh, Shrey Law might be, I don't know which case it's like. I don't know whether it's like the case where we think it applies to just us, and we sort of admit that, uh, you know, when we were talking about it, we were sort of leaving out um, uh, the Jews or the Christians or something like that, and we know it doesn't apply to them. Or it could be like the case where we think it applies to them too. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, so a lot of the work that's in the book goes into trying to explain how we could sometimes be right when we're trying to make claims about reasons that apply to even other people too, other people who belong to other groups or care about other things than we do. Uh, mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I work really hard to try and explain is how it might be true that that even though um, I, um, you have moral reasons because of what you desire or care about, uh, you might have the same moral reasons if you desired or cared about different things. Mm -hmm. So, so Ronnie's reason to go to the party um, uh, uh, isn't like that. You know, the fact that there's dancing at the party is a reason for him to go there because he likes to dance. Uh, but if he didn't like to dance, then he wouldn't have that reason. Um, mm -hmm. But my idea is that. Some reasons can get explained by more than one desire or more than one thing you care about. So, for example, um, uh, Ronnie might um, uh, be interested in um, Isabel, and Isabel might love dancing. So, uh, if Ronnie wants to be around Isabel and there's dancing at the party, Isabel's more likely to be at the party. So, um, maybe if it's a good idea for Ronnie to go to the party if there's dancing there in order to be around Isabel. So, mm -hmm. so if you care about more than one thing, sometimes the same reason can get explained by both. So in this case, I think that the fact that there's dancing at the party could be a reason for Ronnie to go there because he likes to dance, mm -hmm. and also because he likes to is likes Isabel. Um, so in those cases, I think that the reason is overdetermined. It depends on more than one mm -hmm. thing you care about. And one of the main ideas in the book is that moral reasons are massively overdetermined. Reasons that we have to not lie and not steal and not cheat and not kill, at least those kinds of cases, are reasons that they support lots of our aims and lots of our purposes. We do um, things go a lot better for lots of different kinds of explanations uh, when we don't lie and don't cheat and don't steal and don't kill. And so. So we can start off caring about something. I might start off caring about one thing, and you might start off caring about another thing. But still, there are certain kinds of actions that are going to fit better with mm -hmm. the things that we care about. And those are the things that I think you're going to have reasons to do, no matter what you care about. Um, because no matter what you care about, you'll care about something, mm -hmm. which will make those things a smart idea to do. That's the idea. So it, it, I think an interesting implication of that is that then what reasons you have, uh, if, you know, if reasons are, uh, are you know, if, if you have a reason just in case an action promotes your desires uh, or your plans or whatever in the right sort of way, um, mm -hmm. the thing that grounds your reasons is really facts about the way the world is. Uh, it's the fact that doing this actually will uh, be uh, conducive or instrumental to that end. It's not the fact that you want it to be uh, or that you have some special desire to do the thing that would in fact be good for you. Um, mm -hmm. It's just the fact that it would be good for your desires that grounds the reason. Um, right. But then that seems to imply that it's it, you, you. You end up with a different kind of problem of the uh, the escapability of morality. Uh, then, so a lot of people worry that you can escape moral reason simply by not having the right desire. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you give a good a good a good, uh, a good uh, account of why 
I don't need to have in particular a desire to be truthful in order to have reasons not to lie um, mm -hmm. because not lying can help me get other things that I want. Um, but you, the, the escapability of certain kinds of moral reasons can have to do with then facts about the world. So if I live in a place where conditions are extremely poor, say I live under conditions of extreme scarcity and conflict, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, telling the truth can actually endanger my life or endanger the life right. of people that I love, then, um, then I might have very, very strong reasons to lie. So your reasons are going to depend in a very strong way on the background social conditions. Uh, and, so and I want to, I want to resist that too. So um, yeah, yeah. So so in a way, um, the picture I've been describing so far um, mm -hmm. uh, um, has uh, a lot in common with a sort of Hobbesian tradition, where mm -hmm. you might try and explain um, why it is that certain things are a smart idea based on some natural or common assumptions about what's true in a lot of circumstances. Um, and it's a general problem that faces these kinds of explanations of moral reasons or moral obligations that they turn on your circumstances, on whether you're in the kind of situation where lying does benefit or the kind of situation where lying doesn't benefit. Um, so. In the book, I don't. It's not that I try to spell out an exact Hobbesian explanation mm -hmm. of why these things happen, but what I really work hard on is I try to uh, work hard on explain why, it, within my view, it would be easier to give that kind of explanation than people usually assumed. Mm -hmm. So one of the, so one of the important things that happens is that normally, if I try and explain why it is that um, you have a reason to not lie, say, by taking something you care about. For example, um, maybe you care about um, uh, uh, um, spending time with your spouse um, and uh, then trying to explain why not lying um, uh, promotes uh, your purpose of spending more time with your spouse. Um, and um, for, some, for something you might care about, the explanation might be kind of tenuous. It might seem like not lying doesn't make you that much more likely to spend more time with your spouse, uh, even if your overall circumstances are such that you're going to be a little bit more likely to spend more time with your spouse if you don't lie. And so that might seem like it's not a very good explanation, or it might seem like it could only be a good explanation in um, a privileged circumstances, circumstances where um, where not lying is particularly good at mm -hmm. helping you end up with more time to spend with your spouse. Um, whereas if you were unlucky and you were in bad circumstances, uh, maybe not lying would be the kind of thing to get you arrested, and then you wouldn't have very much time to spend with your spouse. Um, so I, um, and the reason it's natural to think that is because it's natural to think that but is, we'll go back to Ronnie's case. I always go back to mm -hmm. Ronnie's case. So, so um, in Ronnie's case, uh, if um, the party's the only place where there's dancing, then the fact that there's dancing there is a better reason to go there than if there are other alternatives where there's dancing. Yeah. And if Ronnie likes to dance more, then it's a better reason. So in Ronnie's case, it seems like how good a reason it is that he gets from the fact that they'll be dancing at the party it's really closely connected to how well going to the party promotes this mm -hmm. purpose he has of dancing and of how much he cares about it. Um, and so if you think that's true across the board, then you'll think, look, although in some circumstances, not lying might do really well at promoting your purposes, whatever they are. Um, you know, all kinds of things, you know, buying a bigger house, spending more time with your spouse, getting ahead in your career. Um, but uh, other circumstances, not lying, would do worse at those things. So if it's like Ronnie's case, where it depends on uh, how good a reason it is, depends on how closely connected it is to achieving your aim, then, um, then I think 
you wouldn't get a good reason in those other cases. Um, but one of the things that I do is I, I try to defend the view that um, reasons aren't always like Ronnie's case in that respect. Sometimes mm -hmm. when you have a better reason to do something, it's not because it does better at promoting your aim. Um, and so I try to divorce the idea, this idea I call proportionalism, the idea that the strength of a reason depends on the strength of a desire and how well the action promotes the desire. Mm -hmm. um, and this is actually sort of the most complicated um, part of the book and the part that's most likely not to work. But, um, uh, but that's what I try to do. And I try to, the idea is that um, this is going to make it easier to give one of these kind of Hobbesian kinds of explanations that might work even in uh, sort of unfortunate circumstances. Uh, as long as you've got, as long as you've got some desire, and not lying promotes that desire to some degree, then I think there's a reason to do it, to mm -hmm. not lie. And then there's a separate explanation of why that reason ends up being a particularly good one. Um, yeah. So, 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 so the. Well, I, uh, let's talk about different different kinds of reasons that you can have, right? So. Uh, one thing that you draw uh, especially well, I think, is that uh, you can have lots of different reasons that are uh, that conflict, and the, and, the, and the fact that they're in competition with one another doesn't reduce the weight of the reason. So one, one example you give is, you know, I want to be both a philosopher and a rock star, and so I, that I might have a reason on a given night to go play a show at a club and also work on my dissertation, either mm -hmm. thing that I choose to do doesn't wipe out my reason to do the other thing. It's just I have... Uh, so, so when I'm deciding what to do, then my decision isn't simply that, you know, what do I have a reason to do? It's what do I have most reason to do. That's um, right. Right? Yes. And, and, so, and, and so, the, so then there's an important question about how uh, different reasons get weight assigned to them, and can you say something about w how you how it is that you think one reason comes to have a greater weight than another, such that that's the reason that's the thing that you have most reason to do? How does I can't I can't I, sh I, I should warn that I should warn this is the most complicated part of the details of the view, but I'll I'll try and, okay. I'll try and I'll convey the basic idea. So the basic idea is that um, uh, uh, when we talk about reasons being weighty, or important reasons, or better reasons, um, we're not, we don't mean that uh, sort of um, they, you know, it's more effort to pick them up, or um, that um, people take them more seriously when they're trying to decide what to do. Um, what we mean is that it's correct or appropriate to take them more seriously in deciding what to do. Mm -hmm. So um, when I say that the fact that there's dancing at the party is a better reason to go there um, uh, than the fact that Isabel's going to be there, because you know dancing is more important than Isabel in my view, um, uh, I mean to be saying that it's appropriate to be more moved by the consideration that there's dancing at the party than by the consideration that Isabel is going to be there. Um, uh, and so, um, so that's my guiding idea in thinking about the weight of reasons. Mm -hmm. Is that um, is that one reason should be weightier than another only if it's appropriate to be more moved by it in your deliberations or you're deciding what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, for, it's, that it's appropriate to, for it to sort of carry more um, carry more weight with you when you're uh, considering the pros and cons. Um, and then um, the idea is to sort of look at what it is for something to be correct or appropriate and try mm -hmm. and evaluate that. And that's something I try to explain in terms of reasons as well. So it, it all boils down to reasons. But, um, but the idea is, um, is that I think it's very natural. It's a very natural idea. Just like um, you know, to say someone's admirable is not to say that they are admired or that mm -hmm. it's possible to admire them is to say that it's appropriate or correct to admire them. I think to say that a reason is weighty is not to say that um, people take it seriously, um, but to say that 
it's correct or appropriate to take it seriously, that it matters more. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so that's the basic idea. And then the but that, that, that seems to kind of generate making. a kind of, but it kind of pushes things back. It feels like so. It, to, in order to say that one reason is more weighty than another is going to, I mean, it, you can be correct. It can be appropriate to give one reason more weight than another. But then the account of appropriateness or correctness is also going to be based in reasons, right? I have a reason. That, that's that's right. So right um, to, uh, it, uh, so my reason to regard it as appropriate or the appropriateness is based in having a reason to give it more weight. So my yeah, reason so, to give one reason more weight is going to be just another kind of reason. Yeah, so um, let's go to, let's talk about, can I talk about admirableness for a second? So yeah. So I think I think one person is more admirable than another, just in case it's appropriate or correct to admire or more than the other person. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that correctness or appropriateness gets explained in terms of reasons. I think what that means is that there is more reason to admire the first person more than the second than to admire the second person more than the first. Not more of any kind of reason. There's actually a complication here. Because some reasons to admire are not really the right kind of reasons to make someone more admirable. So if somebody gives you $100 to admire them, you yeah. know, that's the reason to admire them, but not it doesn't make them more admirable, except mm -hmm. maybe for their, their gutso or something like that. Um, so you have to rule out the wrong kinds of reasons, and that's there's a special problem philosophers have worried about, about how you decide which ones are the right kind and which ones are the wrong kind. But controlling for that, I think that it's correct to admire somebody more than somebody else, uh, to admire Hannah more than Sarah, say, uh, mm -hmm. just in case the right kind of reasons to admire Hannah more than Sarah outweigh the right kind of reasons to not admire Hannah more than Sarah. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, so I think correctness gets explained in terms of reasons. Now, uh, this looks like a, a, a worry, and this is where, why I said this is complicated. Yeah, uh, and the worry is that uh, when you're comparing these two sets of reasons to see which one weighs more, now all of a sudden we're talking about weight, and weight I said got explained in terms of correctness, and now I'm saying correctness gets explained in terms of weight, and uh, that seems like they can't both be true. Um, mm -hmm. And my answer to that is that is that really um, there are some there are some choices where there are reasons only on one side. And so weights don't matter. And when mm -hmm. there's reasons only on one side, then it's correct to go with that side and not the other side. And once you've got some reason, some uh, that which means it's it's there's so if the the two sides were sides about should I weigh this set of reasons more, weigh that set of reasons more, or should I admire Sarah more, should I admire Hannah more, uh, then. Um, it becomes correct to admire one more, to admire the other more, or to weight some reasons more, to weight the other reasons more. And once there are facts about what's correct, to which reasons it's correct to weight more than other reasons, then we can use those to explain why it's correct to weight other sets of reasons more than other sets of reasons. So this is called a, a recursive account, because you start with some simple cases, and then you build up the more complicated cases on that basis. And so that's the kind of solution that I give that sort of tries to keep this intuitive idea that um, that the weight of reasons is how it's correct to weight them, um, but also dissolve this this circle. Um, yeah. And that ends up well, being this the seems, most... This seems like a point where a, 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 an anti-Humean antagonist is going to jump in and say, look, when, you, when you're trying to give an account of this sort of thing, you're, you're uh, sooner or later... You just reach up and uh, basically end up grabbing a reason. Uh, uh, you know, to, when you start talking about which reasons have more weight, uh, what's more, you know, who is more admirable, you end up just going off and dragging something down from normative reality that isn't rooted in your own desire. Uh, that, that it seems like in order to make the case that that it's correct for me to consider. Uh, my duty to help someone in need uh, more weightily than my desire to uh, have a uh, entertaining evening. Um, th th that I'm going, you're going to have to find somewhere 
in my own desires uh, the basis for saying that it's correct for me to give the uh, reason to assist more weight. And, 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 and that just seems, just seems implausible. That, uh, that, that I really, you know, like, it, it, yeah, I, 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 have, I, I have a reason. I have a reason to help because that person needs help. Uh, because norms of helping are part of what give me what I need. Uh, so I really do have... But to say that it's more weighty, uh, you're going to have to find some connection to my desires uh, to, 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 to cash that out, it seems. And that seems like where that's going to be... That I agree. Where I think this is a very, this is a very forceful worry, and the, the way that the account of weight works is the, the most tenuous part of the project in the book. Um, but let me let me first say um, what um, how I, I answer this 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 yeah. worry, and then um, then try and make uh, some uh, broader remarks. So, so the way I answer the worry is that I think this worry just boils down to nothing more than uh, the too few reasons objection all over again. Mm-hmm. So so just like there's a problem about there being too few reasons um, to um, the human theory result in too few reasons because it it can't explain more reasons like the reason mm-hmm. to help Katie. Um, there's a, a similar problem about whether it can explain too few reasons because it can't explain the reasons to wait my reason to help Katie more than other reasons. Um, and I think these problems are really structurally the same. So I think that my answers to the original problem about the reason to help Katie and about why it is that there really is that reason even though it might seem like in some cases there isn't, apply to the other case as well. So the idea is that there's, um, it seems like there's a new problem all over again, but since it's the very same problem that I was already addressing, the solution I was already developing to it is going to apply to it again. That's the, the structural way the solution is supposed to go. But I just want to well, step, yeah. back, step back and, um, and say something about the... the um, the methodology here. Please. Um, is that fine? Oh, please do, yes. Yeah, so so, um, so really uh, most of what I'm trying to do in the book is to um, make sense uh, and explain ideas that I'm very sympathetic to, that people who are anti-Humean have. Mm-hmm. Uh, ideas about how ordinary common sense ideas about morality and ideas about how it's appropriate to deliberate and think about what we should do. And those they're all ideas that I think are very common sense and are very natural to have. And they're all ideas that uh, that people who've started with the Humean theory, which is another natural idea, have been sort of motivated to give up on because they started with the Humean theory. And I sort of think of the project in philosophy as not just saying all the things that are natural to say, but sort of understanding how they could be true. So any time that you have uh, one theorist who um, wants to say some natural sounding things, including that there are reasons that are out there or that are um, there to be had or that are part of something we need to find out about and that are independent of any facts about our psychology, um, I think that somebody in that position has an easier time uh, saying the things that are natural to say. But I don't think that they have an easier time explaining them. In fact, I think that oftentimes they don't explain them. And it's not that I want to deny those natural things. My goal is to continue to believe all the natural things to believe. I don't want to... My goal as a philosopher is not to change your mind about uh, what things are like. My goal as a philosopher is to try and explain how those things could be the case. And anytime you go in for explanations, you risk that things aren't going to work out because you're you're form, you're making more commitments. And so I've taken on some risk in those ways in the course of the book. And um, my hope is that um, is that it it shows a little bit about how some of these explanatory strategies might work. Um, Hands. Mark, here's 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 yeah. a here's a thought that I have uh, about these cases about because I'm I'm ex- actually extremely sympathetic to to uh, your uh, your overall project here when it comes to these questions of thinking about 
uh, conflict between um, what you think a person's moral duties are and what it seems like their most weightiest reason is, given a thoroughly human account of reasons, it seems like the correct answer might simply be to say that um, the fact that someone needs something, yeah, it is a reason to help, um, but that it, is, that it can, may and often is out, outweighed by my other reasons, that the moral reason uh, isn't a trump, uh, it doesn't override my other reasons. But the mm-hmm. fact that, um, that your more prudential reasons trump the moral reason doesn't, um, it, it, that doesn't imply that third parties need to judge what you have done in a way that endorses the weight of your own reasons. Um, so we could see that maybe you had more reason to go to the concert rather than help this person in need. Um, mm-hmm. But nevertheless, we may have reason to condemn your choice. right? So our, sure. our, 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 our judgment needn't track the weight of your reasons. And one of the reasons right. we might want to condemn your choice is that we might c- want to create a structure of norms Incentives. and expectations that change the weight of people's reasons over time. I, I agree with all of that. Yeah, I think that Sometimes the, a lot of our purposes for evaluating people uh, are not just to sort of report what they had most reason to do, but to um, but to uh, condemn or praise in ways that are going to maybe give them extra reasons to do it uh, um, down the road. Um, and yeah, because often what I see is the worry behind some of uh, some some of the uh, anti-human. Uh, critics is the idea that 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 if we say that someone uh, acted on that they did that they that what they did was the thing that they had most reason to do, then we've let them off the hook, right? If we if we we agree that somebody did what they have most reason to do, then we have no basis for criticism. But that strikes me as an uh, as, as as a non sequitur. Uh, with the basis for criticism is that um, we all would be better off if we all engaged in regularities of behavior uh, that were inconsistent with what the sort of weight of your own desires was in that particular case. Uh, and, mm-hmm. so, and, so, and, so, and, and, and so, and so, and so, I, there's a, something overly rationalist to me about a lot of the anti-human criticisms, which has to do with the idea that our evaluation of the normative probity of people's behavior um, is simply a reflection of whether they did what they had most reason to do or not. And I just want to say that what people have most reason to do or not is sort of irrelevant to the question of how we ought to judge what they did. Now, I think I think that you're right that there's a strand of, of resistance to human ideas um, that takes that shape. But I think that um, there are a lot of other strands as well, and so I think it's it's, it's yeah. not very p- dependent on that on that on that single single point. But I think that's right. I sure. do think that um, that uh, um, it was is probably going to turn out that at least in certain kinds of cases, um, and uh, these are cases um, you know that um, uh, come up in questions about whether. Um, you're obliged to undertake great costs in order to help somebody else. For example, in um, to the Jar- Jarvis Thompson's uh, violinist case, where she imagines mm-hmm. somebody who wakes up and they've been kidnapped and uh, been attached as life support for a famous violinist, mm-hmm. uh, and the violinist will die if they're detached. Um, but they have got to, you know, sit there in a room attached to this person for nine months. Uh, and um, that's a lot to expect of them. Uh, they right. didn't make that choice. They um, they were kidnapped and attached to them, and now they've made that choice. And uh, Thompson thinks that's a lot to expect of somebody. And there's excellent moral reasons to do it. Very admirable to do, but that's a lot to expect. Of, too much to expect of somebody for it to be required. Um, and so I I do think that there are going to be cases that are going to have that flavor. 
But I also think that the moral reasons can be pretty good in those cases. Mm -hmm. You know, the reason why Thompson has to come up with elaborate cases is that uh, the clearest cases um, involve cases where there really are really good reasons to um, to sustain the violinist. And I think the Hemian has trouble explaining that too. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so that's something that I've tried to do better at, is to explain how there there could be really good reasons. Maybe sometimes they get outweighed, um, but it does seem I think there are lots of reasons to think that there are strong reasons, even in cases where they're outweighed, um, mm -hmm. where where morality is concerned, and that's something I want to explain. Mark, I'm actually I'm shocked to find that uh, that our, our time is about up. Uh, before we, oh, really? uh, before we, yeah, yeah, it's 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 my my clock says it's been an hour. Uh, so uh, the CD goes so fast. But, but but before we stop, I want I want to uh, give you the chance to say something about because I, I I appreciated the end of the your book about uh, why be human and it has to do with the uh, it draws on some of the things that you were just saying about. Uh, the sort of methodological approach of the book that that mm -hmm. that part of what you're trying to do is is save our you know, widely shared intuitions about what's right in particular cases, but you want to have a theory that actually um, explains this whole set of practices that makes sense of it, and you need a certain kind of um, one of the objections to your kind of approach is that it's reductive that you're trying to reduce all of normative discourse into something like uh, desire, that, 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 that you're trying to reduce reasons into um, something that seems rather less grand than, mm -hmm. uh, than, than, than our uh, sort of magisterial notions of the uh, you know, edifice of morality. Um, mm -hmm. But part of the part of the point is is to actually give something that makes sense of morality that that, that explains it. So I, w I wanted you to say a, just a little bit more about what you think the advantages of uh, of of your Humean approach are over the sort of main competitors. Yeah. So uh, so this gets to one of the central metaethical questions: is whether morality has a place in the natural world, whether it's something that we can describe in other ways or whether um, it's something over and above everything that science tells us about. There's something else to morality. And, um, and I think that there are moral facts, uh, that there are objective truths about the world, and, but they're not extra objective truths about the world over and above what the world of science reveals to us. I think that they are just all, there's a complicated kind of fact about our desires and what promotes them. Um, a kind of fact that make it very hard to keep track of them or think about them if we just talk about desires and explanations, um, but are nevertheless just a facts about desires and explanations and what promotes our desires. Um, and the main thing for me that that does is it lets us explain a bunch of things about, for example, how we're able to find out about morality, even though we don't have any extra intuitive access to some platonic third realm of, um, mm -hmm. of, of moral facts. And, uh, and in particular, and this is one of the things that motivates me the most, although it uh, may sound abstract to non-philosophers, um, I think it explains why moral truths are necessary. Why it is that um, it's necessarily the case that if things are like this, then killing is wrong as opposed to, you know, the way things are, killing's wrong, but if things had been different, maybe killing would have been okay. Um, I think that the, uh, that if moral facts are a kind of natural fact, that that helps us to explain how it is that moral facts follow necessarily upon natural mm -hmm. facts. And I think that's something that competing views have a very hard time explaining. And again, I think that it sounds kind of abstract to a non-philosopher, but it's a, I think it's actually a very difficult thing for many kinds of views to explain is the necessary connections between yeah. the moral and the non-moral. Uh, yeah. So, and I think yeah. your view does it does an outstanding job of, of making that connection. And 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 so insofar as it, it's it's hard to to give an account for uh, 
you know, we, we, the, in, in these cases where you might think that uh, when, if it's hard to explain exactly why on your account moral reasons have more weight than non-moral reasons, um, that's partly a function of the fact that you've adopted a strategy that at least promises to say something uh, illuminating about how there can be moral facts at all. That, so that other theories that, that just stick so closely to the data of our intuition that basically say, here's, you know, he, that here's a theory that basically is a slightly more abstract restatement of all these intuitions, right? Mm-hmm. It, it, that, 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 that might do a better job of accounting for all the intuitions, um, but you might not be able to, you know, say why um, mm-hmm. there are such things as moral facts or why they really have the force that they seem to have. So right. there's uh, you, there's always this trade-off between between having something that is actually useful in an explanatory way that could actually mm-hmm. illuminates how the world could have moral facts in it and how we can have. Um, how normativity can have the role it actually does in the lives of natural creatures like us, uh, and theories that seem to capture our moral intuitions better. And there's always that trade-off, and I always see a lot of metaethics as just people fighting over about how to so balance negotiate it. that trade-off. Yeah, how do you balance it? Uh, I think that's yeah. right. That's uh, good. That's, well, that's uh, we have run out of time, but, but, but Mark, I, just, I want to tell you that I think you do a wonderful job. Uh, this is... Uh, 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 truly is a an excellent example of of just very careful rigorous analysis of a thicket of issues that's uh, that's that's been in philosophy for a long long time and I think you make real progress and so I want to congratulate you on your excellent Thank book you. Slaves of the Past. Thank you. And Thanks I'm for holding on. I'm, I'm right now holding up my second book, Dean Four, also from Oxford University Press. Excellent. And if people if people enjoyed this conversation, they uh, may. Also enjoy that even more. So uh, thank you, thank you so much for your time, Will. Uh, uh, thanks for coming on, and I look forward to uh, reading Being Four as well. Maybe right. Oxford will send me a copy of that too. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Take care, Mark. Bye.